Thank you for joining us. The webinar will start in a few minutes. Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. This is the latest event from the Mindrew Center for Technology and Democracy. I am Gina Neff, the director of the center. Before I introduce tonight's guests, I would like to let you know that this event is being live captioned professionally by human Andrew from My Clear Text. If you would like to have captioning, you can select it using the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Thank you to Andrew for all of his help tonight. Additionally, we'll provide a link to a stream text captioning. This is a fully adjustable live transcription of the event in your browser. If you wanna open this, we're sharing the link to that now. And a transcript will also be available online after tonight's event. Now, before we begin, some housekeeping. The event will be recorded by Zoom and stream to an audience on the platform. By attending the event, you are giving your consent to be included in the recording. Our guest tonight will speak to us for about 40 minutes and then we will have a discussion with the audience. We'll take questions. Questions can be asked through the Q&A function on Zoom. You'll see it at the bottom of the screen. And I will share those questions during our discussion. Please do not place the questions in the chat. You can follow us or tag us on Twitter and other social media platforms at, at MCTD Cambridge, for example, if you're live tweeting tonight's event, and I hope you are. So I'm really delighted that you can join us tonight um, for the launch of a new socio-technical audit um, to assess the police use of facial recognition technology developed by Avani Radia Dixon, she was visiting fellow at the Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy. Now this report comes from a year long engagement that Avani had with us and her fellowship was funded by a Rotary Foundation Global Grant Scholarship. Over the last few years, police forces around the world, including here in England and in Wales, have deployed facial recognition technologies for their work. Our goal in this report and this audit tool was really to assess whether these deployments that, that we know about um, used the known practices for um, safe and ethical use of facial recognition technologies. So this report builds on an existing body of research, what we know about these best practices on the use of data intensive technologies in public. And what Avani does in this report is examine the complexities and challenges that exist when police forces use these technologies. 
So here at the Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy at the University of Cambridge, we are studying how digital, digital technologies are transforming society. And we're doing that to ensure democratic accountability over the increasing power of tech across the globe. What my hope for the, the to audit tool in the report um, is, is that it will be useful to a wide range of, of different kinds of stakeholders, different kinds of people who are scrutinizing how the police are using these technologies and evaluating the use of biometric technologies more generally. So tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by our speakers and I will invite them all on the camera to, um, to, to come onto the screen. First, we have Avani Radia Dixit. Avani is the report author and visiting fellow at Mindaroo Center for Technology and Democracy, and she was a 21-22 Rotary Scholar. She is interested in questions of technology, technology, accountability, and power. She completed her bachelor's degree in computer science from Stanford and is now pursuing her master's degree at um, that university as well in, in sociology. We are also joined by Fraser Sampson, the Biometrics and Surveillance Camera Commissioner. Professor Sampson has over 40 years experience working in the criminal justice sector, having served as a police officer for 19 years before becoming a solicitor, specializing in policing law, conduct, and governance. And we're also joined by Noor Haider, Legal Officer for Privacy International. Noor is a solicitor working across litigation, policy, and public advocacy at Privacy International. And Noor's work focuses on resisting surveillance, ensuring social protection, and protecting civic spaces. And now I hand um, the mic, the virtual mic, over to Avani um, to introduce the report with her presentation and the unique audit tool that she's developed. And I will take a step back and be camera off and invite our co-panelists to do the same. Avani. Thank you so much for that introduction. As Gina mentioned, we are really excited to launch our report today on assessing police use of facial recognition. And I'll start this talk with some background. As many of you might know, police use of facial recognition has been heavily debated. And we looked at this issue in the context of the UK, given that the UK is known to be one of the leading countries in terms of tech policy. In the UK, police often advocate for facial recognition to prevent threats to public security. Facial recognition is seen as an, an important tool that can help address crime and identify missing and wanted people. Now, at the same time, police use of this technology can pose threats to human rights, especially for marginalized communities. For example, facial recognition can impact the rights to privacy, equality, and freedom of expression. For example, in 2017, the London Metropolitan Police tested facial recognition at a Black Caribbean festival in the UK. Here, many innocent people were stopped as a result of being incorrectly misidentified. Now, with the increasing use of facial recognition, there have been greater calls for greater accountability and legislation. So to better assess how police are using the technology today, we explore the question of how ethical and lawful is police use of facial recognition. Here, legality refers to compliance with the law in England and Wales. For example, has there been an adequate human rights assessment as required by human rights, the Human Rights Act? Or does the use of facial recognition comply with principles established in the Data Protection Act? There are also important principles that go beyond the scope of the law. This is why we also consider ethics. For example, do police engage with the community for feedback or are police held accountable if people are harmed? And for our research, we developed a tool that brings together ethical and legal standards for the use of facial recognition. We then tested this tool on three British police deployments and found that all three failed to meet the standards. Today, I'll be talking about this research in more detail. I'll start with our motivation and then lead up to our results and recommendations. So our research focused on assessing 
how police are using facial recognition. Now, what exactly is this technology? Facial recognition is a technology that identifies images of human faces, and it involves an image of a person being captured. This image is then compared with a watch list or a database of known images. And this comparison is done to see if there is a match. And in our report, we launch a socio-technical audit, which is a tool that can help outside stakeholders evaluate the ethics and legality of police use of facial recognition. This audit brings together social and technical aspects of facial recognition in policing and has been developed for England and Wales. To build this audit, we consolidated standards from a variety of perspectives, including academia, government, civil society, and police organizations. For this, we used current guidelines, including UK legislation, outcomes from court cases, and recommendations from the Im Information Commissioner's Office. We also got feedback from more than 30 stakeholders across these different perspectives. In terms of who this audit is for, we designed the audit to be administered by outside stakeholders independent of police. And this can help provide impartial scrutiny. So regulatory and oversight bodies, policymakers, and civil society groups in the UK might be well positioned to either administer the audit or use the findings. How can this audit help these groups? For one, the audit can reveal the risks and harms of police using facial recognition. For example, a risk might be an impact on the right to protest or the lack of oversight over how the technology is being used. The audit can also help evaluate compliance with the law and national guidance in the UK. And the audit was informed by the UK Human Rights Act, the Equality Act, and the Data Protection Act. Finally, the audit can inform policy, advocacy, and scrutiny from an ethics perspective. So what gap does this audit fill? Current work such as impact assessments and guidance are often broad and not tailored to a specific technology. Many also focus only on the legal aspects and they are often aimed for police forces. And this audit complements such work and is unique in that it is tailored to the specific context of police use of facial recognition in England and Wales. It addresses both legal and ethical standards, and it's a tool for external scrutiny. And this makes the audit helpful in improving accountability to the public. Now that I've shared our motivation behind this audit, I'll next talk about our audit scorecard. This scorecard is a tool that other people can use and that can be applied to other places as well. The audit scorecard is composed of a comprehensive set of questions that can be scored. And the questions are divided into these four sections. The questions are not exhaustive, but they provide a set of important considerations. The first section of the audit scorecard evaluates how police show their compliance with the law. This section includes questions related to the Human Rights Act, the Data Protection Act, and the Equality Act, as the use of facial recognition engages with the rights protected by these acts. The second section evaluates how reliable facial recognition is in terms of its accuracy. Facial recognition has been shown to perform worse on people of color and other groups, so we consider questions about algorithmic fairness. We also include, include questions about whether police use robust practices when using the technology. The third section evaluates how facial recognition changes police decisions. This includes questions about the police review of the facial recognition output, questions about preparation and police training and questions about accountability when people are harmed. The fourth section of the audit evaluates the extent to which there is meaningful expertise and oversight over police use of facial recognition. 
And this includes oversight from an independent ethics committee, civil society, and importantly, the broader community. So after developing this audit, we applied it to three facial recognition deployments in the UK. The first deployment that we examined was of <clears throat> South Wales Police's trial of live facial recognition from 2017 to 2019. And these deployments were operational and they were ruled unlawful in the Bridges court case. Our second case study was of the Metropolitan Police's trial of live facial recognition from 2016 to 2019. And finally, our third case study was of a recent trial where South Wales Police deployed facial recognition using a mobile phone app. And this trial was just from December of last year to March of this year. And after applying our audit to these three deployments, we found that all three failed to meet the ethical and legal standards for the governance of facial recognition. These deployments didn't incorporate many of the known practices for the safe and ethical use of technology. And I'll next talk about the key reasons behind this, including issues related to discrimination and oversight. First, we found that these deployments may have infringed upon privacy rights since they might not have been in accordance with the law or necessary in a democratic society as required by human rights law. For example, South Wales police used live facial recognition at a peaceful protest, and this interferes with the right to freedom of assembly. The watch list that South Wales police used also included innocent people who were arrested but not convicted. This broad scope raises concerns about whether their deployments met human rights law legal requirements. Second, we found that there was a lack of transparent evaluations of discrimination, both in terms of bias in the facial recognition algorithm and discrimination in how it was used. For example, the Metropolitan Police did not publish an evaluation of the racial or gender bias in their technology. Although they conducted an evaluation, they did not make the results public. They also didn't publish demographic data on the arrests resulting from the use of facial recognition. And this makes it hard to assess whether there was racial profiling. This highlights the importance of transparency, but transparency does not equate to accountability. And police forces are not necessarily held responsible for the harms. This connects to our third concern, which is that there is no clear framework to ensure accountability for when facial recognition doesn't work or when it's misused. And there is a lack of robust remedy measures for those harmed. We also note that police force documents were not fully accessible to those with disabilities or provided in immigrant languages. And this can make it hard for certain groups to understand how they are being impacted. Finally, we found that the three deployments lacked regular oversight from an independent ethics committee, as well as the broader public, especially the community is most affected. For example, the ethics body overseeing South Wales police's trials didn't have independent experts in human rights or data protection, even though such expertise has been cited as crucial for oversight. South Wales police also didn't consult the public or civil society for feedback before their trials. Now that I've highlighted some of the key issues that we found, I'll next share the recommendations that we make in our report. First, the audit can be used to understand the extent to which facial recognition deployments meet ethical and legal standards. And we encourage others to engage with the broad range of questions that this audit brings together. This audit can also be adapted to assess the risks that technologies pose in different environments. And we encourage others to examine how technologies are used in specific geographical and historical contexts, including outside the UK. Finally, our report shows that some facial recognition deployments 
fail to meet ethical and legal standards. There's also a growing consensus that the current legal framework for governing this technology is not sufficient. Given this gap in legislation and the failure to meet standards, we support calls for a ban on police use of facial recognition in public spaces. Now, as I near the end of this talk, I'd like to share a few final thoughts. First, our report focuses on the adoption of facial recognition by police, but this work can also be applied to its use by private companies. The line between the public and private sector is becoming increasingly blurred as police and private companies often collaborate. Many of the concerns that we raise in our report extend to the use of surveillance by private companies. I also wanna highlight one of the big takeaways from this work, which is that the harms move well beyond the issue of bias in the algorithm. In our report, we highlight important issues, including accountability and oversight. And we need to consider not only harms related to technology, but also the broader structures in our society. And we hope this work is a step in this direction. Finally, I'd like to express some thanks to everyone who helped make this work possible, especially those who provided feedback, my supervisor, Gina, and the Rotary Foundation. Please check out our report on the MCTD website. Thank you so much. And I'll pass it back to Gina for our panel discussion. Thank you, Avoni. Um, thank you. And I will bring Fraser and Noor back to join us for our discussion. Um, first, to bring in Fraser Sampson, the Biometrics and Surveillance Commissioner. Um, you know, there are many ways to kind of think about how to situate this report and this um, this audit that we've done. Um, what do you want people to take away from the concern and focus on police use of facial recognition technologies? Thank you very much for inviting me to this discussion. Uh, Ivana, thank you for the report, which I think is very welcome. It's very timely. Uh, and it's necessary uh, because this is a very fast moving area, but also it's an area where there can be a fairly narrow focus, um, possibly just around the, the legal um, or, or mechanics of, uh, of the algorithms and things themselves. So I think I, I really welcome the fact that you've taken a, 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 this socio technological focus to it and also um, the focus on the wider issues around ethics. Um, the, the, the probably three points that I would make on first on first reading this. The first one is that um, from my perspective, public space surveillance is no longer about where the police put a camera. Uh, it's becoming about what they will do with the petabytes of images that are now available on everybody's camera. And regulating that use um, will require something very different from applying the old rules that we had to a few freestanding CCTV cameras um, that, were, that were operated. When it needed a human to process it all, there was simply too much data uh, to make that useful to the police or anybody else, really. But now video analytics mean that they can now process it and edit it and synthesize it in a way that will transform uh, the surveillance capability, uh, making a lot of good things possible that weren't, but also raising a number of very significant questions about how we we move regulation and monitoring and review on. The second one is um, early experimentation by police forces has certainly set back issues of trust and confidence and not just for the public, also for the police uh, themselves. So when they're considering investment and innovation in the legitimate and lawful use of available surveillance technology, um, the police will still be met nowadays with statistical evidence that is four or five years old in relation to their technology. And of course, in technological terms, that's the Pleistocene era. You know, so much has moved on um, technologically. Uh, but as you point out in the, in the report, just because the algorithms have improved uh, significantly doesn't mean that their usage 
will. So designing out bias from an algorithm um, won't cure continued biased use where it's to be found. And the key, one of the key questions for me is how do we know where it will be found? What are the what are the signs of that? And, and who is watching and what will they what will they do about it? Um, and I think that the third issue for me, which comes from the kind of ethical oversight point, is there's not only the importance of having within a structure an ethical arrangement, uh, and a lot of places will have them as individuals or a committee, but for me, it will be really important that they have a so what capability. So they have an ability to intervene uh, or if necessary to halt something until there's been further evidence uh, put forward around the issue uh, that, that they've raised. Um, all of those things came up uh, very strongly in the report when I looked through it. Um, and I, I think they're, they're much needed at the moment. And I'll be really interested to see how they get uh, taken up and developed elsewhere. Thank you for that. Noor, we spoke a bit about the risks that remain around the use of facial recognition technologies by police. Do you want to do you want to look at um, you know, what would you like that people take away from the, both this report, but also attention on this issue? Yeah, thanks, Gina. And again, thank you uh, to the Minduru Center and to Ivani for um, putting this together. Uh, I would encourage everyone who's here today to have a look at the report because it does actually present quite an innovative way to think about what who should be consulted and how they should be consulted before biometric surveillance is rolled out simply because it meets policing needs, uh, which is often what happens when surveillance is pushed out. Um, but to answer the question which was posed to me, um, one of the, I'll also highlight three issues that we think um, are continuing risks that come out from the report or that build on the report. Um, the first, which is quite specific, and so I apologize to anyone in the audience who doesn't have a a very strong grasp of um, how facial recognition technology works. We can maybe go into it in the Q&A, um, but we um, have thought of a lot at PI about or at Privacy International, which is the organization I work at, about issues with watch lists, which are the um, lists which get fed into facial recognition technology. Um, so in addition to the issues raised in the reports, um, when we think about auditing this kind of technology, we are interested in raising questions around uh, the source of information um, for the data that is fed into the watch lists. Is it only people who have been convicted of crimes? Is it anyone who has been arrested or come into contact with the police? Is it anyone who has a government ID or can the NHS database be accessed? Can the DWP's database be accessed? All of these are questions um, that we think are still to be addressed in this context, um, which goes to the bigger issue of what is the rationale of including people in watch lists and um, what happens when this becomes indiscriminate surveillance. Uh, the second issue which we've looked at a lot is that um, in general, police forces um, are not necessarily trained to have an in-depth understanding of how this technology works. And quite often, as Ivani mentioned, and as I'm sure Fraser will discuss in depth, um, there's an outsourcing of um, the uh, technology to third-party contractors, which brings up the issue of public-private partnerships. This means that um, third parties and private companies have a huge amount of power um, when there's no expertise in-house within the police. Um, one thing I wanted to raise is that, you know, within the police in the UK, at least at the moment, we shouldn't forget that there's issues of institutional racism that have been raised by the assistant commissioner of the Met himself and credible and long-term threat accusations, sorry, of misogyny and sexism. These issues matter when we're talking about the kinds of technologies that are being rolled out, especially imperfect technologies. And the final risk that we would be uh, raising is the exporting of this kind of surveillance from the UK to the rest of the world. Um, when we're thinking about the safeguards that can be put in place in the UK, um, we can imagine an ideal scenario where 
they get perfect scores on the socio-technical audit scorecards, but what happens when this technology becomes commonplace and is exported all around the world? We've already seen that in Buenos Aires in Argentina, uh, a high, the equivalent of a high court has ruled that bio, bio, sorry, that um, facial recognition technology is unconstitutional. It remains to be seen whether it be challenged. We're already seeing that this is something that is receiving a lot of pushback internationally as well. So I'll stop there and then we can continue the discussion. Thanks both for that. Um, you know, one of the things we we talked about was this notion of what transparency and accountability look like. And, and they really look differently when we're talking about uh, large scale data systems, automated systems, surveillance systems um, in, in public agencies versus pushing for transparency from private companies. Um, the blurring of the line between public and private, though, is is quite interesting because, you know, Noor, as you just pointed out, you know, these are not tools that are being developed by police forces or pu even public agencies. Um, there's a there's a whole lot of um, the, the data pipeline and the supply chain of how these these tools get built that are complicated. And and one thing I would like to just note is how much work it took, um, you know, Avani this year to really understand what principles should apply and then apply them to these cases. And, and you know, so it's not a straightforward task to, to kind of think through some of all of, all of these implications. So to, to what extent um, is the goal to have trusted surveillance partnerships or minimal involvement from companies. This is a, a, a question that you know came up in uh, in our in our pre uh, meet discussion. You know how how should we on the outside of this be pushing? And I think Noor, you and Fraser might have pretty different um, uh, expectations of that. How, would you like to take a start on that? Sure. Uh, thanks, Gina. So. Uh, from our perspective, um, given the you know current climate of the relationship between data technologies and surveillance, um, we would be highly skeptical of a context where we're thinking of trust building trusted surveillance partnerships um, with the private sector. Um, we've seen time and time again that the primary interest. Um, when the private sector has control of um, intellectual property related to surveillance technology is keeping those secret so they can protect their profits. That is in direct opposition to the need for transparency and accountability, um, which we see in the public sector. Um, when, for, uh, just to give a very brief example, when we make freedom of information requests um, to understand how certain algorithms um, are being used by the DWP, for example, which is the Department for Work and Pensions, um, they often rely on um, you know, the fact that this is, uh, they're exempt from disclosing this information for the purpose of um, uh, preventing crime, but also uh, because there's some kind of trade secrets within those algorithms. Hmm. Um, now, when you allow a private company to then not only hide behind their own trade secrets, but also um, national security risks, that makes transparency a lot more difficult. Um, so we don't think that the state should become uh, necessarily a conduit for um, the growth of the surveillance technology merely because um, that's what's being pushed. Uh, we think there needs to be a much stronger resistance. Uh, so our answer would be it should be minimal, and we can go into details about that. But I'll let Fraser also answer. Thank you. So I, I think ideally you might want to, or we might want to minimize uh, the amount of uh, commercial ownership, control, direction, uh, motivation um, in, in this area for the reasons that, uh, that Nora's just set out. But I think the reality is that almost all our surveillance and biometric capability already is in private ownership and it's accessed uh, through properly drafted and monitored um, legal agreements. Uh, now, whether those legal agreements are 
are up to the job uh, in new areas such as this will uh, only time will tell but things such as this audit tool section of the report i think take us take us quite a bit further uh down that line um i think if you look at how we currently manage uh fingerprint databases dna um the forensic science laboratories that are working day and night for the criminal justice system um across the uk uh, th those are those are by and large private uh, organizations private entities but i think that there is a very there are a number of very real risks one of them is the overall risk to say we have to be absolutely certain we're not offshoring um, uh, legitimate areas of accountability that would otherwise fall on the police. Uh, there is another one which is not allowing a, a, a commercial entity to simply uh, hide various things that are, that are centrally important to accountability as set out in this report. And I think the algorithm one and the AI black box uh, discussions are, are a really good example of that. So I've had conversations with people who say, look, our black box technology is so complicated. Not, even we don't understand it and can't explain it. Well, if, if, if you've got a statutory duty as public bodies like the police have to demonstrate that you are complying with your public sector equality duty, that won't do. So you need to think about that before you a, a sort of bidding for those contracts or B signing them up from being in the police. If you're trying to demonstrate to your communities that, um, that there is no inherent bias in the technology uh, that you're buying and deploying with their money and in their name, that won't do. You need to be able to demonstrate it. Um, and then I, I've even had some very public correspondence with uh, surveillance technology companies where I've questioned their involvement in uh, human rights atrocities in other countries um, and said, do you acknowledge that those have taken place? And if so, would you explain the extent of your involvement in them? And they have sought to characterize those questions and answers as being somehow uh, commercially confidential, which is plainly nonsense. Um, so I think we have to be very clear about an irreducible minimum of public expectation and transparency and if you can't get beyond that in the way you operate, then don't put your hand up to bid for large amounts of, um, of public money. But I think what we, what we can do, and there are very good examples of this elsewhere in, in policing, is, is have trusted surveillance partnerships with trusted surveillance partners. Because if we can't, uh, the reality is that, that we will be in a lot of trouble, not just as a sector, but as a society. So uh, taking that, thank you both for that. Um, you know, one of the things I wanna remind people, so I've got two, two reminders. First, there is a question and answer box down below. Please, there's a couple of questions there now. Please, if you have a question, type it into that Q&A um, box. And um, the second thing is that, you know, this report is, there is an audit tool. And I would love to hear from, you know, first you, Noor, and then, and then Fraser, you know, how from your world, how would you see the audit tool being used? What use could you see this tool um, being put to? Um, thank you, Gina. So in terms of the audit tool being used, um, it's, I think from our perspective as a civil society organization, um, it's a really helpful tool um, to organize beyond just questions of lawfulness, um, the ethics of any kind of biometric surveillance deployment, which we touched on in the beginning, but we can expand on now. So when we are trying to advocate in this space uh, for increased transparency, increased oversight and scrutiny of any kind of um, acquisition of new technologies, which are supposed to enable enhanced policing, um, we constantly run up against the problem that new technologies are being developed much faster than we can think about these things. Um, so I think one of the really good uses of, the, of this tool is to give us um, a mechanism to think about biometrics specifically. Um, so this relates to not just facial recognition technology, but any system where your biometrics can be um, 
captured, stored, and then used to identify you in a range of contexts. Um, from one of the examples that I would say uh, we would be interested in using it um, for more in depth is um, in the protest space. Uh, we've done a lot of work on what it means to be subjected to um, high levels of indiscriminate surveillance in a protest context, in a protest context, and what it does to not just the right to freedom of expression and the right to freedom of protest, but when people who are fighting the very system that is surveilling them feel like they can't go out and protest anonymously, what happens um, to civic space, what happens to public space. So from our perspective, it would be interesting to apply it to these more specific case studies, um, mm -hmm. so pulling it down into the areas that we work on. Professor? Yeah, thank you. Yes, so I, I, I completely endorse that. Um, I mean, what, one of the things that I found immediately uh, attractive with and about this report was that there are a number of practical uses that I could see immediately. One of them is, is, uh, is as Noor's just described, whereby you can use it not just for this biometric technology and its use, but, but for others, um, for sort of in, internal uh, checking and guidance in the way that you might do internal audit for other uh, risk-based um, upstream uh, monitoring. Uh, but earlier this week, we we from the office had been at the Biometrics Institute Congress in London, and there was very clear agreement there on the need to provide people generally, so externally, with information about the technology, the way in which it's used, what the policing purposes are, how you can uh, uh, push back against that, where you can complain about it, how it uh, uh, and how it fits in with their wider statutory uh, and common law duties. But I think it's just as important to arm people with questions uh, as much as information. And I think what this, what this audit tool does is it provides you with a series of assurance questions. I, a lot of people that I speak to when they're discussing their views about and their approach to the adoption of new technology in this, in this type of setting will say, well, it, I think it's all right which is kind of a felt response, which is fine up to a point, but not very far. Um, so what I encourage them to do is, is, is go through a series of challenge questions and then see if they've assured themselves by the end of it. And if they have, fine. And if they haven't, there are areas to feedback. And, and it's reaching for those challenge questions to get self-assurance, um, even internally, because they don't really exist. And I think they exist very clearly in this in this setting, so it has a very practical um, application that I think will will certainly move a lot of the conversations on from a felt response of, uh, I think that's all right, or, or, or absolute horror of horrors. Uh, if you've done nothing wrong, you've nothing to worry about. If anybody's got any any residual uh, sympathies with that awful view and the worst possible surveillance you, advice you could give everyone look on the website because i've said that was five very compelling reasons why that's about the worst approach you can have to any form of biometric um but that's a different point but this uh, it is a is, is a practical uh, toolkit i think then that can be applied across a whole series of emerging biometrics thank you one thing I would add, sorry to interrupt, Gina, just because I, I remembered as Fraser was speaking that I think the socio-technical audit is really great for is that it shows how many considerations at this stage and in the current, like uh, how the technology is at this point, it shows how many considerations need to be taken into account before anything even close to lawful or ethical can be uh, can can be used to describe this kind of technology specifically because of how intrusive it is and um, how inaccurate it can be and how it can be deployed. So one of the things that it also helps us to do is to say, um, sure, if you think that you can meet all these different things in all these different ways, maybe we can have a conversation about when it can be used. Um, but given that that's highly unlikely and really difficult to do, we need to restrict the use of facial recognition technology to instances where it's 
not live, where it's retrospective, where it's one-to-one -one and in a very restricted context. So for example, within a police station, rather than having these open um, scenarios where you can be building a watch list from private companies and government databases and, and so on and so forth, and then uh, deploying it uh, without the safeguards in real time. Sorry, just wanted to add that. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, and, you know, it, that follows on to the next question, which is, um, you know, it, it we really saw the goal of moving from a kind of general principles about um, large scale data into into practice. Right. It's, it's time to get real about lots of these technologies. How do we how do we put those principles into practice? And that's been the work that Avani has done. And Avani, I'd love to invite you to just reflect on how you think um, this tool could be adapted or used in other jurisdictions or in other places. What do you, what do you think it would take? Definitely, yeah, thanks for that question and Fraser and, and Nora for your perspectives on, on the audit and its connection to the use by private companies. And in terms of adapting the audit to other countries and jurisdictions, I think there's a lot of potential in how the audit can be used. As you mentioned, the audit is built on these basic principles of accountability, transparency, and fairness, and those places can definitely extend to other countries. I think a few considerations that uh, would need to be made if the tool were adapted is First, the law in that jurisdiction. I think second is how policing is structured. And third is the history and culture of policing in that region. So with regards to law, this audit was developed using specific legislation in the UK. And so specific uh, legislation would need to be incorporated depending on the jurisdiction where the tool is being adopted. Um, with regards to the structure of Policing in the UK, policing is fairly decentralized and police forces often have local ethics committees. And so we use this feature of British policing in our audit to assess whether those local committees provide independent oversight. And when applying this audit to other areas, the specific structure of policing would need to be considered. And then third, as Nor mentioned, the history and culture of policing is really important. And in the UK, there are known to be discriminatory policing practices. For example, black people are far more likely to be stopped and searched. And so in other regions, for example, in India, other factors like religion or caste might be more relevant in terms of policing um, and discrimination. And so that history and culture needs to be incorporated. Um, but overall, I, I really do encourage others to use this audit both in the UK as well as other regions to help bring more accountability in how the technology is used. That's a great launching point for our first set of audience questions. So I'm going to turn to a question by Marion Oswald. Thank you, Marion. And Marion is one of the um, wonderful people who helped give feedback on this report. She asks three linked questions. How should the police themselves use this audit tool? Could you see a link with the government's algorithmic transparency standard? And um, in a in a quirk of of Zoom, I I scrolled down because someone someone asked a great question. Um, and are there any relevant factors, issues, questions that the police might think are missing from this tool? So how might the police use it? How might it link to um, the UK's government's algorithmic transparency standard? And what might police think are missing? Thanks for that question. Uh, yes, definitely. I think in terms of how police themselves uh, should use this tool, I think the audit is primarily aimed for outside stakeholders. And the reason behind this is that stakeholders independent of police can help provide more meaningful and, and impartial scrutiny. I think police, though, can definitely engage with the broad range of questions in the audit about ethics and legality, and Fraser talks about this as well in terms of those being um, items that can be considered, especially as they are maybe deciding or proposing the use of this technology. And going through those questions can be helpful in, in assessing whether the structures are in place, place to really use this technology in a way that is accountable and has oversight. 
And then to the second question, which, um, let me just look at this, um, about uh, the government's algorithmic transparency standard. We definitely use that in developing this audit. And I think that standard can apply to technologies more broadly. While this audit is tailored to police use of this technology in a specific context. And so I think they in that way are, are both complementary to each other. And then finally, in terms of relevant factors that police might think are missing, I think those are definitely important to consider in terms of policing priorities and a public risk. And we hope that we're able to start some of those conversations and that releasing this report today opens the dialogue for some of those conversations and maybe feedback from many stakeholders, including police organizations. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from, and I'm, forgive me, Jake, Jake Laperke from CDT. How does the use of facial recognition with images taken from smartphones work in practice, Jake asks. Maybe Nora Fraser, you want to pop in? How 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 does that work? Um, I can try and start answering the question, but uh, Fraser and um, Ivani, please feel free to jump in with corrections about my description of the technology. Um, I th and Ivani, I think because the case study included um, the South Wales police's use of that, I think you might be able to correct us on this. Um, when we think about facial recognition with images taken from smartphones, um, we think about um, the images that are taken, extracted from the phone and then um, stored by police. Um, so I'm not sure about taking the photo from a distance prior to interacting. Um, that I don't think they would need phones to do that because they would be mounting um, surveillance cameras um, to capture those images. Um, but that would be an instance where um, it's used your own, the data that you hold is being used to inform um, the watch list that they're using. Ivani, do you want to jump in? Yes, so I think in the case where, uh, for example, South Wales Police used a mobile phone app, um, it was the case where an individual was stopped and then um, perhaps I think the in South Wales Police's uh, procedures, they had certain requirements in terms of uh, reasons for stopping that individual. And then once that individual was stopped, um, an officer would take a photo of them um, and compare it to their watch list. So it would um, entail stopping or questioning them first and then taking an image of them. So we have another um, pair of related questions. Um, Kevin Doyle asks, can you give an example of a use of facial recognition that would pass the audit? And then um, an anonymous attendee says, uh, asks, you know, there's open source researchers like Bell and Cat who use the same fa commercial facial recognition technologies um, for justice and accountability um, purposes. It, can, we, can we ever justify um, good use of facial recognition te technologies? I, I invite any of you to take a stab at that. Maybe Ivani, can you imagine a, a use that would pass the audit? I think that's a, a really good question. And so we applied this audit to three case studies in England and Wales. And I think there is a potential for a use of this technology to pass the audit. But as Nora highlighted, there's really a this long uh, list of questions that are critical to consider before such a technology is being deployed. And I'm not sure whether the way that the technology currently is being used comes close to at least meeting the requirements or standards established by the audit. And I think moreover, this audit too has limitations and there are risks that go beyond the specific questions that we consider in the audit. For example, the export risk that uh, Noor talked about in terms of even if we're able to get a technology to say pass this audit in the UK, what happens now when that technology is exported to other areas? And so I think while we can maybe work towards improving 
accountability and oversight and the standards, standards in the audit, we also need to consider maybe what are things beyond this audit and what questions and considerations uh, still might need to be there before deploying such a technology. Gina, I think it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a very good uh, question. I think that there has to be uh, a use of this or a series of uses of this whereby it will pass the audit. Otherwise, we are just creating a list of ideals that we know are unattainable against a technology which is, if used properly, the first true game changer, I think, in some areas of policing since DNA profiling. Um, and what that means is it's not only the police um, who will be very keen to use it appropriately and proportionally and, and, and very much accountably and with an eye on learning all lessons from it. There is a legitimate expectation from the public that they'll do so. Uh, and I think that is a, either a general expectation particularly when people know what they can do in their own lives. And if they were to go out looking for their own missing uh, children or their own vulnerable relatives or so forth, and then uh, thinking, well, why, why can't our police do this? Um, and I think there will, there will be areas where we very quickly move into a, a world where the police are spending at least some of their time explaining why they haven't used some of this technology. Um, and the third point, Related to that is, uh, which picks up on the Bellingcat question, uh, increasingly the police are relying on images that they've been sent by the public. So they've moved from a world in which they've traditionally needed images of the citizen to one where they also now heavily rely on images from the citizen. And that creates an entirely new surveillance relationship, I think, with the citizen. But it also ramps up some of the expectation because if people are submitting images, uh, whether it's following a, a specific request um, or whether it's of their own volition, there will be a, a, an expectation that something will be, will be done with that. Now, whether that's a, a legitimate expectation or not um, is still some way down the line. And I think that's a, another area that we are only just beginning to understand in the context of how much the police rely on images that somebody else has, which goes back to my first point about public space surveillance is about what they do with available images and those images that will be available in Yottabytes um, probably by the time we've, we've finished the year. I think we're bumping up right next to time, but I, Karan Tripathi asks a great question and I wanna use a, a minute to, to do this. I'm gonna paraphrase in the interest of time. Um, does our understanding of and jurisprudence of rights and ethics need to evolve? To evolve? Um, for example, established understanding of human rights, such as the right to dignity or self-incrimination. Um, what, what is our fast-moving technology doing to our notion of rights? Well, can, can I pick up on that really quickly? I think it's doing a great deal. One is, is it's making it much more than just data protection. Some of the uh, reasons were outlined by Ivani, you know, the sort of chilling effect to your right to protest uh, may be very uh, profoundly constitutional effects, nothing to do with protecting the data. I think also when you look at cases where things have happened in, involving um, uh, people who have died, uh, and taking images of them or photographing uh, yourself doing things to them. Um, there are invasions, gross invasions of, of uh, dignity and respect involved there. But again, data protection laws that we currently have only protect the living, so they don't extend to that. And the more that those things are, are shared, the more we realize that uh, we need to expand some of the uh, the, the legislative framework to take account of that if we're really serious about uh, dignity, respect, human rights and ethics. Um, one thing I would add to that is that um, definitely we address the human rights issues, but um, from a criminal justice perspective as well, we have to understand what it means when we're subjected to indiscriminate surveillance. And we've compared it to, for example, being constantly stopped and searched, which is something that nobody um, at this stage at least is okay with. So when we allow this kind of technology to proliferate, we have to understand that it kind of amounts to that 
unlawful and continuous stop and search, uh, whether it's with or without cause is another question, but that's an example of how our rights discourse does need to move on. Thank you, Noor. Thank you, Fraser. And thanks to Avani's tremendous work on this report. We have a new set of tools for advancing conversations that about the values we want in the technologies that we have and the values that we as a society should seek to protect, including these notions of, of, of human rights. I wanna thank all of you for attending today. You can download a copy of the report on our website at mctd.ac.uk. Um, details of future seminars can also be found on our website. And in particular, our next event will be the launch of a new report um, on the 21st of November. This report's written by Dr. Margie Cheeseman. She is an affiliate of the center and it will be explaining the myths and realities and problems of Web3 technologies, especially when used with at-risk communities around the world. And we hope you can join us for that launch. We would very much appreciate hearing from you if you could complete a short feedback questionnaire that will be sent by a Eventbrite that helps us with planning our events. Please continue to follow our work um, and the great work of scholars like Avani who work with us um, on Twitter and other social media platforms. And that handle is at MCTD Cambridge. Thank you all again for joining us today. Thank our speakers, thank Avani, and, um, and continue to be um, invested in and following this kind of important work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.